Hello everyone, and here we are on the next episode of Cloud Launch and Learn. And today we have actually Luis Beltran. He is going to present for us. And before this session, actually we we're chatting a little bit. He's joining from the beautiful city of Prague. So how is the weather there, Luis? How are you doing? Oh, it's a sunny day. Uh, it's great uh, to see this uh, awesome uh, weather. So after maybe the presentation, maybe I will go walk around a bit. <laughs> nice, nice. That's great. And uh, I want to kind of welcome everybody again, like good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending from where you are joining. And we're excited to start this session. And um, today, as you may already know, we are going to speak about an excited, uh, very excited topic called ML.NET, which stands for machine learning.net, I believe, right? Is it true, Luis? I'm not yeah, making that, right? right? OK, that's good, right. good. And there are a lot of magic involved behind that. But you know, we have a magician in the studio. And Luis is going to help us to unwrap that and you know, show how this machine learning you can master with your existing skills in C-sharp, right? And as a myself, I'm an old C-sharp developer. So I know one or two tricks. And I'm also looking forward for this session to learn something. So based on that, currently what you see on the side is actually this announcement of this session, OK? And you see there is actually QCR code. You can use that QCR code, just you know, scan it and get this URL. I'm going to paste in that URL actually in the session so that you can use that. It's a learning material from Microsoft Learn. And you can actually use that to get ahead of the game and learn about ML.NET and machine learning from Microsoft, OK? So I shared that link for everyone. And now uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. And uh, here's the session, right? Here's our hero. And he's ready to rock. And I hope everybody is also ready. So please uh, welcome, Luis. Uh, and please take the stage. Now it's your time. Thank you very much, Erkan, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, presentation. I hope that during the next hour, uh, you learn, you find this uh, session interesting. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them in the, in the chat. Um, between sections, we will uh, respond or try to respond uh, the best that I can uh, them. So yeah, let's uh, get started with this session. So ML.NET, machine learning, and deep learning uh, for the C-sharp developer. Uh, so my name is Luis Beltran. I am a Microsoft MVP in AI, artificial intelligence, and developer technologies. Uh, I am from Mexico, um, by the way, but currently I am uh, living in the Czech Republic. I am a student at Thomas Bata University in Slin. Uh, I'm also uh, very lucky to, um, because I, I work as a researcher, but also lecturer. Uh, and I'm saying lucky because that's one of the, I mean, being lecturer is one of the uh, most passionate jobs that I can uh, get or have. Uh, right now, well, I teach to foreign students. Uh, here at the university in Mexico. I'm also lecturer at Tecnológico Nacional de México. Uh, greetings if anyone is joining from, from, from there. And well, I also enjoy talking about mobile applications with Xamarin, cloud computing with Azure, and also artificial intelligence. Uh, here you have my email, my uh, also Twitter account to handle. Uh, feel free to reach out, send me a message. I will uh, try to uh, be available as soon as possible. OK. So uh, these are, the let's say, our agenda for today. Uh, first, we will talk a bit about machine learning, brief introduction. Then we will move to ML.NET, which is the main topic of today's presentation. And we will present a demo where we use uh, C sharp code, ML.NET, and we uh, perform image classification using deep learning capabilities uh, from ML.NET. Okay, so machine learning. 
Well, um, maybe you have uh, seen some examples in movies or in real life of machine learning. Rather, rather than start with the definition, well, we, we can check some, some examples. Um, for instance, when you check your email, you might find that some messages are in your inbox, but others are sent to the spam folder. Or maybe they are categorized by newsletter or notifications. In this case, the uh, email providers, right, such as uh, Microsoft with Outlook or Gmail, Google with Gmail or other providers, pre-train a model or they are using a model that in the past, right, was, was trained uh, uh, and is able to identify when a new message arrives to our uh, mailbox, what's the uh, most probable category that this uh, message should uh, should go into. Mm, and what is analyzed? Well, you analyze, or sorry, the, these providers might analyze uh, some metadata, maybe headers, right? Like uh, who is sending the message, what is the subject, what are the contents, if there are any attachments, right? So, well, you, you know, maybe if you use very specific uh, spam, spammy words, such as like a prize or a lottery, or that you won some award, right? Or that, or that you inherit some money, but also if the sender is not, let's say, um, trusted, right? Or is coming from a specific domains, that gives uh, more points, let's say, to categorize this message as spam, okay? But on the other hand, if it is from one of your, uh, let's say, contacts, or it includes some uh, normal messages or normal attachments, no uh, harmful uh, attachments, well, it will be a normal message. Uh, it will be in your inbox, right? So that's machine learning, basically. That's one of the applications of machine learning, to be able to categorize uh, or classify uh, some inputs, in this case, uh, messages. Of course, how this model is, how, how does this model uh, categorize or how is it smart? Well, before there was, a, a, as I was mentioning, a training. Thousands, millions of uh, messages were provided for uh, some uh, program, right? Then uh, most probably these messages uh, have a label or th this is known as supervised learning, which means that someone, maybe an expert, right? Said, okay, this message is spam. This second message, is normal one, goes to inbox, this third message is a spam and so on. So the algorithm, the program, starts identifying patterns. Okay, what are the main characteristics that define a spam message? What are the characteristics of a notification message and so on, right? After the training process uh, finishes, the model uh, has identified, well, okay, the relevant uh, patterns or uh, attributes from uh, a spammy uh, message. So then now it's turn to evaluate how accurate is this model. So new uh, other messages are sent to the model in order to see if the model correctly classifies them or not. If the classification is correct, of course, it will score more points. The evaluation will be 
uh, better. Uh, but, uh, okay, if there are mistakes, yeah, the accuracy decreases. Uh, this is uh, not a single uh, time process. This uh, improves from time to time. Uh, maybe you, you want to improve the accuracy, so you provide new data or you adjust some parameters, right? The idea is that at the end, the model will be able to predict, will be able to classify uh, new data, when, uh, of course, but it needs some uh, tuning or some uh, high accuracy, okay? Good. So basically, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence, and the idea is to create software, build applications that learn from data, improve accuracy from time to time, but you don't directly say, okay, uh, these are the rules for uh, spam, these are the rules for normal message, and so on. It is not explicit, explicitly programmed to do so, all right? And yeah, supervised learning, label data helps a ton. And well, in machine learning, there are three main uh, tasks. Uh, the first one is classification. We already explained that one. Uh, sometimes you want to predict some value, like numeric value. So you might apply a regression. For instance, you want to predict what would be the price of a product, OK? So according to historical data, previous uh, values from uh, the, the previous days, months, or years, right? Uh, you will get or you will be able to know what would be an approximate price of the product tomorrow, next month, next year, and so on. Or maybe uh, how much a stock should a company uh, acquired from specific uh, goods, okay? Yeah. And the third uh, task from machine learning is clustering. Uh, this one is uh, quite interesting because basically it's kind of classification, but you don't know the category names. You don't know uh, if it is a spam or, for instance, in, in case of images, if it is a dog, a cat, or whatever. In this case, you have individuals, you have, let's say, objects, you have data, and you want to know how closer they are, right? So you can create clusters or groups. Uh, so you can see in this picture, there are like three groups, the yellow, red, and blue. So they are similar. They share some uh, characteristics. They are uh, quite, as I said, uh, similar to, to each other. I mean, the yellows, the reds, the blues, yes. So in this case, maybe you can say that you, you want to know about customers, right? Uh, some customers prefer, let's say, uh, sport items, or some others prefer uh, books, or but also they prefer I don't know, um, some particular kind of food. The, the idea, let's say in this example, is that maybe uh, online, an online store wants to uh, target some uh, advertisements, right? But, but they, they want to like show some, some advertisements in the, in the uh, website. But this one, they, they want to show personalized uh, um, items, right? So uh, when you go to Amazon or these uh, online stores, you might see some recommendations from the store. OK, maybe you would be interested in buying a, a soccer ball or a shirt from some uh, sports team. But these items are not random. They appear because you are part of a cluster, right? And, and the company, of course, wants to show some items that uh, the user uh, might be familiar with or they have the, mm, the highest probability that the user can might interact with either by just checking the details or even buying it, right? So yeah, 
uh, companies according to the uh, records of customers, right? Or previous, uh, um, let's say, uh, orders, previous purchase orders. They want to predict what is the next product that you will be interested in, so they can maximize their their income, right? So yeah, that's one another um, another example. Then um, deep learning is actually part of machine learning. It is also used to solve some uh, problems, particularly uh, classification tasks, uh, mainly uh, using uh, images or audio or even text, OK? They work with uh, neural networks, but deep neural networks, so actually they require a uh, high uh, computation uh, architecture or, um, let's say, uh, resources. Um, but th they, th well, actually, if you have a GPU, you can accelerate or speed up the training process of a deep uh, learning, or a, sorry, of a deep neural network. Uh, so yeah, they, they are quite effective in discovering uh, patterns. So, so for, for instance, maybe we, we have uh, some images, as I was saying, of uh, cars, right? Uh, uh, but you want to identify different type of cars or different models. Uh, like, okay, this one is a sports car, this one is, um, I don't know, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar a lot with, with cars, but, but the idea is that depending on the image, it can recognize, right, uh, which belong to one category and which belong to second category or second class and so on. That, that's the idea. Again, you can use uh, supervised learning, so you can provide, okay, in this picture, there is a, a sports car. In this other picture, there is classic car and so on, right? And the idea is that you provide a uh, huge uh, amount of data and it will be able to determine what are the characteristics of each class. So when new data is coming, it will be, um, let's say, it, the, the probability of uh, determining which class this car belongs to uh, is uh, high, OK? And we will uh, uh, explain a bit what is inside a, a deep uh, neural network, right? But uh, one of the important steps is the feature extraction, which means, OK, what are the characteristics? What are the uh, patterns that every class follows, right? So when new data is coming, uh, how is it determined that this is actually a car, or this is a dog, this is a cat, and so on. OK. So, so yeah, there are a lot of mathematics uh, inside, actually. So well, let, let's start from the uh, high level. So we have an image, right? And we want to determine, OK, which, uh, I don't know, if it is an indoor or outdoor um, picture. So deep learning actually performs, as I was saying, some mathematical operations and determines first low level features. So you can see here that uh, maybe, well, we start with some pixels, we start by determining some like uh, borders, right? But then you apply some uh, mathematics, this is called convolution. And then it will be able to determine some borders, some edges, right? Uh, where the color is changing or where there is another object, right? So they might be known as mid level features. And you perform some other mathematical operations, some other convolutions, right? And it will be able to start uh, filtering or determining other elements, other uh, edges, other borders. And it will recognize some shapes at some point, right? And depending on the shapes, 
it will be able to later determine uh, some output, right? Because, for instance, if the uh, neural network determines that there is uh, like a window or a kitchen or a sofa, right? It will say, okay, this belongs to indoor picture. But if it's it, if it finds, okay, maybe there is a tree, there is a mountain, there is uh, some grass, okay, this is outdoor picture, right? But it, it doesn't determine this immediately, as I was saying. It starts uh, little by little from uh, this low level uh, features. If we see this first picture, we don't know what is it, right? But if we uh, start determining some edges, if we perform some mathematical operations, we might be able to see some shapes, as, as you can see here, right? OK. So, so yeah, actually, these mathematical operations uh, are, uh, let's say, they work with uh, matrices, right? And, and they apply a filter. So we have a filter, let's say, this uh, set of numbers, this matrix of numbers, to the, the image. We know that this image, input image, can be described, yeah, OK, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, there, are, there are some numbers there, but maybe because of the background, you cannot see it. But you know that this picture, in the end, uh, we can represent it as an array of numbers, maybe RGB representation, right? Or some uh, saturation level. OK, so we can take the value of every pixel, right? or a set of pixels, and we can start applying this filter. What does applying a filter means? Well, it means that maybe we will perform a multiplication of matrices, right? So we apply these, we start getting some values, right? And after we combine the, the filter, or we apply the filter, let's say this three by three matrix, uh, and take three by three subsets, inside the, the picture, we will get this uh, convoluted image, right? We we'll repeat this process again. We will obtain another convoluted image and so on. In between, in between convolutions, there will be another uh, operation known as pooling, max pooling or average pooling, uh, which means that, again, we will take some subset of the picture and we will take, for instance, the maximum value of, of this subset, right? Uh, and we will, uh, let's say, decrease the, the size of the matrix X. That's, that's the idea, OK? So, well, yeah, th there is a lot of, uh, let's say, mathematics involved. There is a lot of, uh, it's an iterative process, actually, right? And well, we can build our deep neural network uh, let's say manually, but currently there are some frameworks, there are some libraries uh, which help you to perform this or, or create this program, let's say, faster. I mean, write them because, the, as I said, there was some Keras, the, the, sorry, there are some frameworks like PyTorch or Keras uh, that you can use in order to uh, write a deep neural network very quickly. But then to uh, run uh, this uh, neural network, it will take some time and resources. As I was saying, it will require like a GPU, for instance, to speed up the process. Uh, it also depends on how much data you, you have. But consider that these experiments uh, work well with uh, thousands of data or even millions of data. OK. okay. So first, um, before we reach our next section, I would like to know if there are any questions about machine learning? OK, I'm monitoring okay, the I chat here, Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yes, I, I looked at it. So there are some conversation going on about the interest uh, on nice. ML.net, and there are c developers who joined. But there isn't any specific question so far. Everybody is just kind of you know testing the waters here to see mm -hmm. how it can be applied, the benefits, and how to get started. So go ahead. If there is any, yes, I will sir. let you know. 
Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Again, if you have any question, just leave them in the chat and I will try to answer them. Okay. So now let's move into ML.net. So uh, regardless if you are an expert or not uh, in machine learning, uh, you can use uh, ML.net. Well, first of all, what is ML.net? ML.net is, uh, let's say, framework uh, that is developed from, for, from Microsoft, where you can use F sharp or C sharp knowledge, right, skills to create machine learning applications. It is open source and it is also cross platform, which means that uh, you can create uh, an application uh, using Linux, Mac, or Windows. Right now, I am presenting in a Mac computer and I will uh, demonstrate that it works in, in Mac. Uh, because, well, it is not uh, touch or dependent on Visual Studio, actually. Uh, you can use editors. In, in this case, I will use Visual Studio Code, right, to, to have this uh, uh, demo later. Uh, so, so, yeah, because, well, usually when you want to create machine learning applications, the first choice is Python or R languages. Well, C Sharp is also an alternative thanks to this framework. So, so yeah, basically, it doesn't matter if you are not data science expert, but you know uh, how to write programs in C Sharp or F Sharp, yeah, you can use ML.NET. And you will see uh, what do you need or how, how easy it is to create this, because again, there are some libraries the team has been working on improving uh, the algorithms or providing more features to, to the framework. And also another advantage is that uh, after you uh, run, let's say, uh, uh, a program with uh, ML.NET, you can actually export the model. We, we mentioned earlier in the machine learning explanation that after you train the, 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 the model, right? You can use it to classify new data. So, so yeah, again, you can also create a model here and actually you can take it to, to the cloud. You can take it or export it to a Docker environment or even to other clouds, right? Uh, so yeah, that's one of the advantages that, that the model you can create, for instance, you, you can have uh, or you can create a web API, right? That uses this model in order to uh, be to 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 process uh, data that is coming from a mobile application. That's a classic scenario, right? That you train the model, you export it, you publish it as part of an API, and maybe the users um, have uh, mobile devices, so you create an application and you send some requests to the to the machine learning model that is in the cloud or that is uh, a part of the API and you get a response. Yeah, that is also possible. Okay, so first of all, ML.NET is available as a NuGet package, okay? So basically, you will have to install this one right? uh, for most uh, scenarios. But then if you want to uh, focus on specific tasks, you might need to add other uh, NuGet packages. Uh, so for instance, if your data is coming from a database such as uh, SQL, right? Uh, you might need, or sorry, you need to add this uh, package system.data.sql client if you want to uh, perform Anomaly detection, which is another task that I did not mention earlier, right? I, I told you that there were three tasks. Well, actually, there are four. <laughs> the fourth one is anomaly detection. Anomaly detection is basically the analysis of a time series, right? Uh, so, for instance, imagine that an IoT device um, sends 
telemetry data. M maybe they send uh, uh, the temperature of a room to, to, to the cloud, right? And you want to know if the temperature is uh, stable, right? Or if at some point there is a peak, either high or low, right? In the temperature, maybe you have a plant there and you want to avoid uh, such cases where the temperature uh, rises a lot, which, uh, which can uh, hurt your, your plant, right? So, so, so yeah, you, you can have this collection of time series points and then try to find if there was an anomaly, if there was some value on ex that was unexpected, right? So in this case, uh, you can also um, uh, create uh, such uh, applications with ML.NET. In this case, you will need Microsoft ML time series nugget package. And there are others for Onyx models, which are which is another uh, possibility. Uh, in our case, actually, we are going to, because we are going to perform later image classification, we will need to add these packages, Microsoft ML Vision, Microsoft ML Image Analytics, e, and, sorry, <laughs> and C-sharp TensorFlow Redis, okay? Yeah. Then after we add the packages, uh, one of the main objects that we will use along our application is the ML context. The ML context is, uh, contains everything that you need or is the starting point because you can, uh, load your data by using this object. You can uh, perform some uh, tasks on your data, such as normalization, uh, which is, or you can, yeah, you, this is the feature engineering process. Uh, you can call or start the training process. You can uh, apply it later when you deploy the model to predict. You can evaluate the model. You can uh, get some insights or log and the, uh, what is happening with your model, right? And, and, and some other activities. So yeah, you will basically create an instance of the ML context class and you will have a lot of uh, properties and methods. So yeah, this is something that you will definitely need. Uh, then we have the I data view. Uh, in this case, the I uh, data view is um, where you uh, load your data, right? Or the data is represented, right, in, in this. It's like a data frame, let's say, that, that you know from the Python world. Uh, basically, uh, you, you, get your, you have your data in a database or text file, or maybe it is coming from the cloud, or maybe it's just a enumerable collection, right? An array, whatever. Sorry, yes, okay. Good. So, so, so you create an instance of a data of a data view, and you store your information there. But this I data view has some characteristics. Uh, first of all, well, it supports many dimensions, so it is high dimensional. It is immutable; the information does not change. And finally, and this is one of the most important, is uh, it supports lazy loading, which means that the data. Uh, will be, let's say, in memory or will be active as long as you need it. Maybe you have, let's say, 10,000 uh, rows of data, but, uh, well, of course, if you have this in memory, it means that, yeah, you need a lot of resources uh, or it will use a lot of space in your memory. But actually, this lazy loading means that, OK, maybe when the training process starts, it will take batches of data. So maybe it will analyze 1,000 rows. Then it will take the next 1,000 and so on. It will not, you will not have all your 10,000 or millions of data in the memory because, yeah, this is not good for a program or for a software. So it will only load in memory what it needs. And then 
after we will go to the next batch and so on, right? So it is memory efficient. It doesn't make sense to have all the, let's say, um, all the data if you don't need it or if the process does not need it at some specific time. Of course, the data has some schema. Yeah, there are some characteristics. For, for instance, maybe you have a text file, you have a data set, and this data set has uh, five columns. Maybe this is a CSV file okay, where there is a flower type and some characteristics, uh, sepal length, sepal width, and so on. So, well, uh, you will create a class in your program, right? So, which represents, right, or which has the, uh, the similar schema. You don't need the exact, uh, let's say, header or title. So, for instance, here I have label, but in my data set, I have flower type. And this is true because there is an attribute, load column. So, basically, this is what uh, the, the program will know, okay, the first uh, column, will be mapped into the label uh, attribute of this class. Then for sepal length, which is the second, right? It will go to this one and so on, right? So when the, uh, so, so yeah, basically a class defines the schema. And uh, later in the iData view, which I mentioned in the previous slide, yeah, in memory, imagine that you will have this, right? So basically, it's the same like the representation, but you define uh, the, the attributes or the column names or even the date types, right? You, you, you have float or you have, yeah, there is a mistake here. It should be a string, of course. <laughs> yeah, this is an string one. Um, so yeah. Then after you load your data, after you define the schema, um you might process your 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 information before you want to apply it into training process so maybe you have missing data uh, maybe you want to convert or normalize right Co convert to some uh, other data type maybe you have integers but you want floats or you have some uh, strings and you want to convert them into categories, right? So, so, so yeah, you, you need to perform some operations. Uh, these operations, uh, for, for these operations, you will create a couple of elements, I estimator and I transformer. The I estimator is basically uh, like a blueprint of a house. It's like a plan. What activities, what tasks uh, will be there? For, for your data or will be applied for the data. Uh, so for instance, if there are missing values, uh, we will replace them. Okay, if there are some nulls, right? We will convert nulls into, uh, let's say zeros or maybe into one. I know it depends on the data that we are modeling. Uh, maybe we want to combine two columns into one Right, so we can concatenate them. Maybe we want to create a copy of a column. Okay, we, we have a lot of um, tasks that we can perform over our data. So this is a plan, right? And when we say, okay, do it, then that's the I transformer, right? That's okay, let's uh, go ahead. Let's, uh, you, you build a pipeline. Basically, in the I estimator, you will create a pipeline. The pipeline is the set of uh, tasks that will be applied to the data, but it's just the plan. And then the transformer is, okay, go ahead, let's do that. Okay, Ex it's the execution of those operations. Uh, then when you want to train uh, the, the, the model, well, you need to choose an algorithm as a, and a task. So for instance, may maybe uh, we want to apply uh, classification. What type of classification? If we have two classes, it will be binary. If we have more than two, it will be multi-class classification, right? 
So after you choose the task that you want to apply into your data, classification, regression, um, anomaly detection, image classification, you select a trainer. And the trainer is basically an algorithm. It can be, I don't know, a neural network. It can be, in this case, uh, a stochastic dual coordinated ascent. It can be, uh, I don't know, um, a Poisson regression. It can be, yeah, there are different trainers. And actually, you can add different NuGet packages in order to incorporate more trainers into your pipeline. OK, so you can have the same algorithm for different tasks. Yes, that is possible. You, you can have uh, a stochastic dual coordinated ascent for binary or multi-class classification or even for regression. Yes, uh, both uh, are the, the trainer itself. OK, you need to choose one. You, you want to know what, how, how the uh, model will be created and actually yeah the output of the training process is an ml.net model the ml.net model is basically a zip file it's a serialized compressed file that contains metadata of uh, the the data schema the data transformations which means what operations were performed to the data and also the algorithm that was selected this model is the one that you take to another computer to you publish it as part of a web API, or you take it to the cloud, or maybe in the future, you will integrate it into a mobile device, right? So this is the model that will be used for prediction of new data, OK? And you can export it. Yeah, that, that's the advantage, OK? And this is the last uh, slide before the going into our demo. Uh, basically, here, uh, as we were mentioning, we can also perform uh, deep learning. So in this case, we can use um, uh, the image classification, right? Uh, you, well, for deep learning, yeah, you can analyze images, or you can analyze text, or you can analyze audio. In this case, we will go for image classification. Uh, you can use some pre-trained models such as ResNet or Inception version 3, right? Or maybe you can take a TensorFlow model uh, that you created uh, yeah, in Python or even in um, Custom Vision, because Custom Vision can export TensorFlow model. And then uh, you can use it as part of your pipeline in order to uh, classify new data, OK? And we will actually do that. OK, so before we go into our demo, uh, let's see if there are any questions. Yes, so we have a question. Uh, yes. It's about how many data points do you need to perform for anomaly detection? OK, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, as the name suggests, anomaly is something that is not expected or, or that is not, uh, let's say, uh, usual or normal. Uh, there is not uh, like um, a specific number, but I can tell that uh, we, we can we can think of uh, one of the examples of anomaly detection, which is the fraud detection in in um, bank uh, transactions. So imagine how much uh, how many bank transactions are processed every minute, and of course the the, the banks want to know which operation is not uh, correct, is not uh, actually like a good one. It's most, uh, uh, most probably a, a fraud because it involves money that doesn't exist, right? So even, let's say, 1% or less than 1% of your data could be an anomaly, yeah, that is, that is fine. So for instance, maybe if you have 10,000 points and, I don't know, 100 or less than 100 are anomalies. Uh, yeah, that, that, that can work. Uh, but as I said, it, there is no specific number. And it also depends on the business process that you want to, to analyze. Let's go back. Let's go to something, let's say, smaller. Maybe the example that I was mentioning, like the 
temperature that you are analyzing from an IoT device, maybe you have 2,000, sorry, 200 points, and you have 10, 15, 20 anomalies. Yeah, that, that, that can work. Mm -hmm. Without any, any okay, issue. good. So, so in terms of, uh, it, so it depends on the use case. That's my understanding. And plus, mm -hmm. it depends on the, you know, if your use case is to detect mostly the anomalies, I believe you need to have more points, right? More data mm -hmm. points because that's your purpose. Mm -hmm. But if it's less concerning, then you can have, you know, one tenth or, like, you know, a certain portion of your data points can correspond to that, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you for answering. Let, let's continue with the demo then. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Good. So, well, uh, then I will go here to Visual Studio Code. So, well, yeah, uh, this, uh, I don't know how much time. Okay, yeah, we are almost. There. Well, um, this uh, model takes around uh, six minutes. I'm not sure if we have all the six minutes. Also, it depends uh, because right now, for instance, my computer is uh, processing video, is sharing, so maybe it will take more, more time. But here I have the terminal. I run this uh, model, let's say, uh, 30 minutes before entering this, this room. But I will explain. First of all, yeah, this is a console application. Uh, you can see uh, here, OK, let's, let's start with something else. OK, so in this case, I have some, some data. I have it here. I have some pictures which uh, show some problems. So, OK, give me a second, because maybe you will not be able to see them, but uh, just give me a second. Now you will be able to see. So here we have some problems of cars. So you can see some scratches in this one. You can see this lamp is broken, and this one, well, has some damage, OK, uh, in, this, uh, in this object, OK? So uh, and we also have this uh, data set, this index, yeah, this index CSV. This is a CSV file. Well, actually, I think I included, yeah. This is the, this is the, this is it. So we have these pictures, right? As I was saying, we have, of course, the file names zero, one, two, three, and so on. And we have this CSV file, which contains for every row the file name and also the issue, right? So the first one, maybe we don't know it's the okay for zero. Okay, zero, we don't know the the name of the problem, but for the first one image one, this one, the issue is known as headlamp. Second one is door scratch. Third one is headlamp and so on, okay? So these are, every picture has some issue with a car. And we want to uh, analyze these, uh, let's say new pictures and find out if a model can see what's the problem, right? Good. So this is our input data. As you can see, we need to create a class which has uh, at least these attributes, the file name, the category, and also, okay, the subset. Subset, the, there are two, training and validation. Of course, training is for the first part. Validation is to know if the model is accurate or not. So let's go back to our program. I have my model here, I have my class car image. And I have these three attributes that I mentioned, the image path, the damage class, and the subset, OK? Then later, I have another class which has the same, sorry, it has the image path, the damage class, and the predictor label. Uh, of course, this one later is to know if the model, um, wh what is the? Prediction, what does the model say about a new image, OK? And we can compare, because uh, maybe we know uh, what is the, the label. And if this label matches the predicted label, yeah, it is accurate. If not, 
Uh, of course, no, that means a no. Okay, so these are our models. They will be part of the data schema. Uh, then, as you can see, I have added, uh, let's open the, give me a second. Let's open, yeah, the CSPROG. I have already added uh, some Nuget packages, such as Microsoft ML, Microsoft ML Image Analytics, Vision, and SciSharp TensorFlow Redis, which I mentioned earlier, all right? Good. After that, we can create our program. So as I said, this is a console application. First, we have our uh, um, namespaces. You know, this is very classic C-sharp application. Uh, then I have some uh, strings where I have like the, OK, where are my images located? Where is my uh, data set, index uh, CSV, comma, comma separated value? Uh, yeah, and also this is where I will save or store my model uh, at the end. And yeah, so, some log to record or to write uh, everything that is happening. Okay, then I have some method where I load my data. In this case, uh, basically, uh, as you can see, I am uh, adding a list of uh, car images. Uh, uh, if you remember, we have this model. So we have image path, damage class, and subset. And you can see, yeah, we have the path. The, the path is li like the folder, right, where all the images or the pictures are there, right? And yeah, basically, this uh, method reads all the lines of this CSV file, and we insert everything inside the uh, a collection and i enumerable collection okay so so yeah. that's it so this reads the, the 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 csv file and print message just prints in the console okay so this is our main program in the main program we uh, create an instance of ml context then we call the load data method so here we will have all the all the contents of the CSV file. Then, as you can see, we apply uh, link queue by uh, with the subset. It is there is T, there is B. So I create a couple of I enumerables, training images, validation images. Then I create the I data view, and you can see the I data view is created by using the method load from enumerable, right? And we have, of course, two collections, training images and also validation images. So, so yeah, here we have our, our two data views. Then we create our pipeline. This is the estimator. This is the plan. What uh, we want to apply or what we want to do for the, uh, before the training, or sorry, for the training, actually. So in this case, for instance, we want to open, right? We want to load the bytes. So if you remember, the CSV file contains the path of every image. But in our training process, we actually need to go further. We need to go inside and uh, load every picture. So we can do that with the, with a, this is a data transformation. There is a method low row image bytes. So basically, it takes the path, and we will have the the the, the bytes, okay, the, the content of, of this picture. Then, uh, for the training, uh, we see we have okay this column image bytes. We also provide some label, okay. In this picture, there is a scratch. In this other picture, there is unknown category. In this other picture, there is broken lamp, and so on. Okay. And for our image classification, we will use the Inception version 3 architecture, right? Uh, so yeah, this is uh, what will help us to, to identify uh, the, 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 that there is a car, and then what problems, what issues are there, OK? And after that, uh, yeah, we, we, we specify what we want to predict. 
So we need to say, okay, the damage class uh, is what we want to predict or we want to classify later, right? And again, this is just the, the plan. After we use the fit method, the fit method is actually performing the training, okay? So this step, this is the one that takes 15 minutes or so, right? And if you check or if I show you the terminal, you see uh, loading data and then training starts. And training starts, of course, of course, is what I just mentioned earlier here. This is the training starts. And here it will start analyzing all the pictures. And it actually prints the, the learning rate, how it is uh, going, how it is like evolving, right? Uh, so here you can see the results of all the iterations, uh, how much, Im how many images were processed per batch, uh, what is the current epoch, epoch one, two, three, this is the iterations, they are known as epochs. The accuracy, how is it like uh, um, uh, um, evolving, right? So yeah, it takes a lot of time, you see it's a lot of messages, right? And after that, the training is completed, so it took like six minutes or something, right? And after that, there is a validation. And the validation is, okay, I have another subset of uh, data, another subset of images. Let's see if the model is accurate. For these other images, we also know uh, what is the label, what, is, what should be the problem, right? So, because, well, you, you saw in the CSV file that we always know the image path and also the, uh, the damage class, okay? So we will compare if the predictable label aligns or, or matches the damage class. If so, that's a check. If not, if not the accuracy will decrease, okay? But of, of course, this uh, is internally evaluated and done by the um, evaluate method, okay? In this case, since we have many um, categories, this is a multi-class classification problem or task, right? So here you have context, multi-class classification, evaluate, and now we are using the second data view, prediction data view, right? And yeah, of course, we specify what's the column that we will use for the predictions, encode the label, then we will print some uh, accuracy, how it is uh, working or evolving. And you see the results here, validating model, you see the accuracy is 67%. Okay, we might need to increase that. And here you see some results. Okay, so there were actually around 1,500 images, 30% uh, were uh for the sorry no 25 percent are uh, for the validation right so so you see for instance this image is bumper dent that, that that that's what we know and this is the predicted by the model uh, class bumper dent there is door scratch for this image and yeah it co was correctly predicted of course, there might be some mistakes. I mean, let's see. Some cases. Oh yeah, for instance, here, it says that the problem is a bumper scratch, but it actually predicted a tail lamp. So yeah, this is expected. If one uh, model is 100% accurate, uh, that might be suspicious because it might mean that there is overfitting. Overfitting means that the model is memorizing the results, okay? So yeah, um, uh, th there is no 100% uh, machine learning model, yeah. And yeah, so, so after we finish the validation, we just save the model. So there is here, very simple. We just call the save method, right? Uh, and if you remember, we specify some path, and you can see the zip file here. 
image ML model version 3 zip. It was created, as I said, 30 minutes before entering the session. And just to finish, uh, also, we uh, load the model to evaluate new pictures, right? And these new pictures are not part of the training or validation. There are these four. So let me show you very quickly. Yes, Luis, we are on time now. Can yes. we uh, sum it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah there, this is actually the, the end. So you can see these four uh, pictures. As I said, these were just taken from internet. And for each, there was a prediction. So the first one is uh, bumper dent. Yes, it was correctly classified. I mean, there is no supervised learning. This one is this is a new picture. So yeah, it was correctly classified. For the second one, there is a scratch. Yes. Third one is a glass uh, problem. And the first one, the fourth one is a tail lamp. Um, so yeah, basically you, well, yeah, I, I will, I will share this into GitHub. Uh, I will share my, the, the presentation and also the code that you can find uh, there. Um, and well, I will share yeah, this, uh, this, this is my GitHub, I think so. So in the next hour, I will, uh, you will find these uh, resources uh, there. Okay. That yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you for sharing all this, uh, Luis. And you know, he, you see the you know information about how you can get this uh, code uh, from Luis. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to say that please uh, fill into the survey feedback about this session. We, uh, we are really looking into your feedback to improve this and make it even better. But this was an awesome session. Thank you for ML.net. You know, uh, way at and it's. It, people and everybody was looking into some basics how do they how how do they can get started and do this work and i believe you know you touched that very well so thank you for session and thank you everyone i don't see any questions at this moment uh, on the stream so enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining thank you everyone and okay and bye for now all right